I am back from vacation and I'm super excited today that we're taking a look at the Doom Book of Chaos number eight. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer. This is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, I take a fanzine from my collection off the shelf for a closer look. And a new one to my collection, this is Doom Book of Chaos, number eight. It's not dated, but I'm pretty sure it's from sometime in 1984. Hope you enjoy the video. I'm back from vacation and glad to be back to Fanzine Friday. Uh, I picked up a number of fanzines over the summer break, and one of the ones I'm really excited about is this. This is Doom Book of Chaos, number eight. You may recall from my series, I had one through six, then, I, then later on I got seven and nine, so now I've got eight, which is the one in the middle. From what I understand, there is a Doom Book of Chaos number 10, but I think it's just sort of like a greatest articles, greatest hits sort of fanzine that collects stuff that was from the earlier publications and didn't have new material. I'm still on the lookout for that to round out my collection, but I think I've got all of the primary publications from, from this one. As I mentioned, it's not dated. Uh, they say in the introduction that they were trying to set a record for the longest time between two issues of the fanzine, they think that they've done it. You may recall that issue number seven was from early in 1983, and we know that uh, issue number nine is from the late fall of 1984. So I'm not positive if this would be late 83 or early 84. I haven't seen anything in here that, that locks that down uh, for certain. But that's the eight, uh, sort of the, the range where the uh, where the fancy comes in. This one is what we're used to. It's a heavy stock, just plain white um, cover, and then regular pages folded in half and stapled uh, through the middle. So let's take a look at this fancy and uh, see what we have in Doom Book number eight. So the first thing is the uh, the cover art. This cover art is actually uh, by. John Grandage, and he says he kidnapped the art that was given to them by Hudson Shaw, who'd been doing a lot of the art and continues to do a lot of the art in this fanzine. But this is John Grandage's here, and it's uh, some it's very fantastical uh, art. You've got these two lizards or dragons down here at the bottom who are breathing fire on the root ball of this plant, which has only a couple of leaves hanging from it. And then for me, at least, it looks like in the background there's the moon and there's some kind of little fairy creature. I don't know what's going on. Um, maybe it's just supposed to be an interesting uh, piece of art. Let's take a look at the table of contents. Uh, we had the editorial, which is by uh, Brad Bennett and uh, John Grandage. And if you remember, they say Des is off, I think, getting settled wherever he's moving to next in life. And then Des ends up taking it over, and Brad and John are sort of gone from helping with this by, by the time issue nine rolls around. Uh, they, they, they mention in the editorial that um, Des has great plans to turn this into a multi-million dollar, you know, magazine. And so maybe that was sort of the plan that they were turning it over to, um, to Des Irwin to run from here on out. Going to Kale is an article by Graham Staplehurst where he talks about um, sort of world building. Amoeboid Thoughts is sort of the APA style insert from John Grandage. The fears of the sorcerers are uh, as new magic items. The truth about monsters is, uh, I guess, a, an article by Hudson Shaw about where these monsters appear in fiction before role-playing games came along and sort of giving you some information about what they were, how they were described in there before they've been changed somewhat for, say, Dungeons and Dragons. Zerk is a little one-page uh, article about uh, a new race of characters for a sci-fi game. NPCs as real people, how to flush out your NPCs. Uh, the Critic is a short story. It's just a little one-page piece of fiction, I guess, or, or creative writing. Um, the Art and Science of Motorized Mayhem is talking about the game Car Wars. Other Worlds is um, Mike Lewis's uh, sort of APA style insert. And then the Ilio is a new monster. And Tales from Morak is, um, uh, is fantasy fiction. Our contributors, you know, we have Des, John, and Brad, although Des I don't think actually contributes in this issue. And uh, we mentioned most of the folks who are providing written content content here, I think, or we will when we get to their articles. And then um, Hudson Shaw provides some art, John Grandage, and also Jeff, uh, Jeff uh, Cordery provides some of the art for this fanzine. So here's our 
uh, our editorial, and they talk about the fact, obviously, how long it has been, and uh, they appreciate everyone's patience and everyone's contributions to help the fanzine keep going along the way. And then again, mention that Des Irwin's sort of going to take this over from here, and that's definitely what you see when you get to issue nine. Uh, they say very prophetically, um, where they say this. Uh, the future of the Doom Book is rather uncertain, and that is what it was because they had one more issue, and then there's sort of collection of pre-published material, and then that's that's the end of it. Here's some art. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Hudson Shaw's little creature face with some mushrooms growing out of a skull, and then uh, I don't know what this little sci-fi looking guy is, but he's in here a couple of times. Here's the first article. Um, I liked it. We'll talk a little bit about it. Um, going to Kale and uh, Graham Staplehurst, and, he's, and he says uh, this is interesting stuff, I think. So he's, I'm 20. I've been um, just getting out of university, been playing RPG since I was around 15. I'm very interested in stuff, especially Dungeons and & Dragons. And he says, I've written articles over the past four years in publications ranging, ranging from Demon's Blood to White Dwarf. And so I don't know if that's, um, if that's truly supposed to create the spectrum. And it's an insult to say Demon's Blood is like the least professional, maybe White Dwarf the most professional. Or maybe he just mentioned, you know, amateur to professional. I don't know. Demon's Blood I thought was really good fan team. Um, and then he says, I'm going to talk a little bit about a part of my world, uh, which I've described in the Beholder number 20. Great really popular, well-known uh, fancy The Beholder. I've got all of those. And so at some point when I'm willing to take a sort of half year and dedicate it to one fancy, and we're going to look at the, uh, we're going to look at The Beholder. So what he wants to do here is he's going to pick just an island and give you some detail about it, tell you about how he comes up with generating the information for it to give you both something you could use, but also more particularly to show a, a dungeon master or, or referee how he goes about building out his campaign and the kind of information and thought you need to put into building out a campaign. Okay, so first he's got this map, this little island of Agronon. It's a little island mostly inhabited by, as he calls them, hobbits, with just a couple of places where there's some humans, there's some types of elves down in the forest to the south. Um, but this is his little tiny you know, microcosm he's gonna use to talk to you about, about how he does his world building. So he gives you information. He says like there's actually two different subclasses of hobbits here, the burrs and the sandies. And he talks a little bit about the differences between them. Their seat of government, this little island, this on the right hand side is um, Sparrow Port, which is the largest city and that's sort of the seat of government. And he gives you an idea about their council of five and how they run that and the family that tends to always get elected. Someone from this particular family has always elected the mayor. And he goes around to the different um, towns and tells you a little bit about them. You know, you've got Vale, which sits in a Vale, and he talks about the agricultural products of pipeweed and other um, crops that they grow and why they're important. It goes down to, you know, the next one here called uh, Ketel, uh, Coastal Village. You know, talks they, they also grow, I think everyone grows some, some uh, pipeweed, but barley and hop, but they're also on the coast, so they have some fishing merchants comes up to King's Hill, which is inland, you know, and it's one of the cool things about it. There's off to, in the outside of town, there's like this giant cross that's out there. So there's some unknown history about that, some connection perhaps to Druids in, in the past. Goes around, talks about each of the little settlements, St. Peter's, that's where most of the humans on the island are. Um, so it goes around, and explains all that, right? And gives you the kind of the general detail, the general feeling for what's going on in the different towns or, um, and what's unique about them. And then he says, you know, when you go to design your village or hamlet, this is the way he explains it, there'll be about 300 people in a village or 50 people in a hamlet, around five people in each house. And so you need to draw out a little map and show the appropriate number of buildings based on the number of people that would be there. And then he's got this chart, um, which is where he lost me, where he explains in excellent mathematical detail how to go through and figure out who lives in your village or your hamlet. And so the short of it is he's got types of people down the left, the number either in villages or hamlets that the probability that one of those people or how many of those people are likely to be there. Um, the uh, 
if chance that they're married, if so, the number of children they might have, who the leader of that particular household, like what, how likely are they, are they maybe a fighter, some other class or zero level, if so, what level they might be, how sort of rank they're in society, you know, are they a nobleman or a counselor, or, um, just an average person. And I just think to myself, remembering that there are 300 people in a village and 50 people in a hamlet, and he had six, eight hamlets or villages, you know, around on that map. That is a lot of work. And maybe that's his point. Um, but I can just say from my own experience, when I design a small village, you know, I've got three or four key NPCs. And then, frankly, everybody else is kind of boring. Um, and I don't take the time to figure out the profession or background of every single NPC someone's going to build. Meet. Um, you know, I guess it depends on what your players are looking for and how often your players just randomly go door to door knocking and talking to every single person they meet in the town. But uh, very thoughtful. And I, I did think his um, explanation of not only sort of here's something that I've created to give you an idea of the kind of detail he puts down on paper, but also the mechanics and the kind of an example is very helpful, even though the chart was a little, for me, a little overwhelming. Okay, John Grandage has his little APA insert of a few pages called Amoeboid Thoughts. Um, and so he goes and he explains this uh, world of Arda that his characters are, or his, his folks are playing in and goes through this explanation of how they were, um, you know, they were underground last time and some of them show, they pop out into the water they float up to the surface. Um, they see this giant fin. Some of them can fly. Some of them can levitate. Uh, one guy gets left in the water. He hops up into a boat that appears out of nowhere. And so he avoids the megalodon attack. Um, one person couldn't get out of the water and punches the megalodon in the nose at the last minute. Well, while also a bunch of arrows come out from out of nowhere and hit the megalodon and then it you know, swims away. Then some alien spaceship rises out of the water and takes them all inside and um, he describes that and then they you know they have this weird encounter with these, these alien creatures who then the alien creatures leave them uh, let them go and then they end up on some island and they've got alien technology it was all <laughs> really gonzo um, but anyway you know gives you some idea of what his uh, his gaming sessions are like and then he talks about another type of character class for D&D. &D. He says, oh, you know, last time we had these mind warriors. And I think what he's saying here is that he cut their power in half. He thought they were okay, but probably overpowered. And so he says, yes, I've decided to cut the power, their sort of psychic, sonic power in half. And now they're weak enough that if someone wanted to try and be one of those, they really could get overwhelmed and, you know, get killed. Um, and so there's a lot more risk in trying to play that kind of character class, I guess. Um, the other thing he has in mind then is running a monster as a player character. And he actually has a whole, almost looks like a separate article about that, which, which I actually thought this, you know, was the better part of what he had for this issue. So he talks about how you, what's the background that would cause a monster to decide to go into an adventuring profession, if you will, and, and also the idea that you have to sort of start at level one, so why wouldn't you just want to be a regular monster? That seemed a little bit too metaphysical for me. But I think the real question is, like, just how do, what type of monsters could you run and how would you do it? You know, there's some discussion in some of the early rule, rule sets, right, about running all kinds of different things. I think Gary even says you could even have a dragon as long as they started off weak enough. Um, I think for me, the thing here is like, I wouldn't want someone to be a, you know, a basilisk or a, some other, I don't know, you know, gelatinous cube trying to be a player in a campaign. But I think if you had a humanoid, maybe you have a knoll, a goblin, um, something like that. I, I think, you know, I, I don't know that I would do it, but if someone wanted to, it seems this humanoid type of um, monsters could be at least theoretically okay to be, uh, uh, to be characters. You know, he says the key is you get start, and this, but his idea is interesting. So your idea is you start with one hit dice. And then, unless you, that's beyond what you could get to as a maximum under the monster manual. And you get one attack. 
and you get um, one point, and I'll explain this in a minute, to use in his point system to start to buy anything else that you are able to do. And this point system is kind of interesting. So, and he says, this isn't everything, but it gives you a pretty good idea. You could figure out how many points different things should cost based on this, just kind of look and get a feel for it, right? And so every level that you, you use magic user XP and you gain a level. And when the monster gains a level, they can either gain a hit die or they can gain, use a point um, on this chart. They can't do both. And so for example, paralysis, poison, or petrification by touch is gonna to cost you two points. So you'd have to go you know, two levels without any benefit to, to get to earn that up. And again, these are only if your monster could originally do this. Petrification by gaze costs four point. Over here on the right, level drain. If you drain one level, that's two points. Two levels is three points. Three levels is four points. Um, attacks do more than D8 of damage, depending on how much that is. If you want to sort of increase your damage ability, that costs you some points. Regeneration, invisibility, magic resistance, really good armor class costs points. Immunity to certain things like silver or magic weapons, you know, that costs points. And so you start off with don't have, sort of none of that is activated yet. And he talks about, especially for things that aren't just humanoids, things that have, you know, special abilities. Like he has an example in here of a, someone playing a wraith, an undead. Um, and, you know, at first level, they don't have any of their normal special abilities. So this is his idea of how you could do that, which is, again, not something I plan on trying out in my campaign anytime soon. But I think very interesting idea. Um, if someone wanted to do that, of a, of a way to try and do that, if you really wanted to try and figure out how to work that into the rules. Spheres of the sorcerer are magic items, and there are three different types of spheres, um, black, blue, and silver. They look like a six inch crystal ball. They have a magic word on them. You cast read magic, you can use the magic word to activate it. And then they get really big, big enough, I think it says for four human sized people to get inside of them, 10 feet across. So you go inside and you end up sort of inside of a sticky um, sphere that you can use, like the stickiness allows you to stand up, I guess. And then the owner can cause it to magically move. The um, black one only will go through the air. The blue one will go through the air or through water. And you some magically have oxygen during that time. And the silver one will do air or water or open up into another um, plane of existence. Four hours they can activate and move, and then it's got to go 20 hours dormant before it activates again. It doesn't say this, but I think the rule would be even if you only used it for two hours, it's still going to wait 20 hours before it goes active again. Um, and it's it's you're, you're largely um, not going to be noticed you know, if you get attacked it's sort of like it takes some damage and then um, you it will still move but you'll lose the sort of protection that it gives you from um, from outside attacks so you're moving through it now right but then like the second attack or the third attack I guess you know maybe does some does some damage to everybody inside um, so anyway that's the, that's the new magic item that's um, Dave Emmett's idea. Kind of interesting. And as he says, take the general ideas and tweak it however you think to make it the best for your game, which is actually a great comment on the way to use new monsters, new magic items. You know, don't use them word for word, but take the creative idea and say, okay, that's that's pretty good, but here's how I need to, you know, edit that to use it in my own campaign. Hudson Shaw's got an interesting article. It's um, sort of academic. It's about the truth about monsters. And so here's what he tells us. He says, you know, orcs aren't uh, pig-faced uh, humanoids that we see in D&D. Orcs, for example, he said, is a sea monster whale-like with a boar um, tusks on its face and large eyes. That's how it's originally described, he says, um, by the ancient, I think, ancient Greek, Pliny, um, Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, which is an ancient um, story. Talks about the Golden Legend and other places where orcs come from, but it basically says, look, these are water-based monsters. Maybe based on the orca whale, we don't know, but anyway, some type of sea creature. And now, of course, he says, you know, Tolkien's goblins, or uh, orcs are goblin type of orc, or um, taking the goblin and giving this sort of orcish pig-faced um, edit. 
hobgoblins. He says, you know, they're not really goblins. They're actually some type of a um, spirit that was like inhabited a house and maybe cleaned it up after night, did different chores in return for you leaving it out some food or other gifts. Elves, he says, you know, are maybe maybe taken from Alphil, um, ancient story that has to do with Adam and Eve and Eve hiding her children. Gnomes, he said, are one of four types of uh, elemental creatures, the gnome being the connection to the earth, um, the sylph for the air, the salamander for fire, and the nerid for water. He says gnomes basically, you know, could move through the earth without resistance, like you and I can walk through, you know, through air without resistance. Um, but basically creatures that lived inside of the, you know, the ground and moved around were through the original gnomes. He's got ideas for gargoyles, um, the gargoyle, a water spouting dragon from, uh, from French legend. Uh, and he talks a little bit about gremlins, which he says more has something to do with the world wars and in inhabiting uh, aircraft. So I'm not sure where the gremlin story comes from, but anyway. I always think that kind of thing is interesting. I'm always interested in learning more about sort of legends and where the origin of some of these different monsters comes from. Here's Hudson Shaw's artwork. I just always like it because I think his art is really, really good. One of the real highlights for me from Doom Book of Chaos is getting to know Hudson Shaw's art. So this is for the game Space Opera. Um, he says these zorks and they are bubble bellies. It's a type alien creature. I don't know. Don't play the game. Didn't understand the point of that. NPCs as real people, Richard Lee's article, and his point here is the back to the campaign and the detail of the time you spend ahead of time. He talks about the great improvement that can be made in an encounter if you take a few minutes and give each person, like this is a band of bandits, a little bit of background beyond the obvious level three fighter, level three assassin, you know, here's his equipment, his armor, whatever, coins, whatever it is, you know, that he carries. And so this is his example. So we've got Horik, uh, just a horrible person who loves killing people. I'm shortening the description. You can see it's a full paragraph. Um, Telniath, who is, uh, um, had a horrible upbringing. His you know, father was heartbroken, became a drunk, killed one of the kids, one of the two boys. He gets hanged for murder. Um, the boy goes and finds his mother who's taken up some lover, kills the lover in a battle, but then people put a price on his head, so he runs away. He's been on the street since he was 13. You know, so he's kind of, uh, you might say, a little bit more sympathetic. We've got this guy who is a ranger, but he's subject to Aegeus, and he's out looking for a sword, and he's heard that these bandits have a lead on how to find this, perhaps find this magical sword. Um, he's got Drum, the first level orc. Um, who he says, you know, now he really likes Horik, the really bad, you know, evil guy. Um, uh, the, the ranger really likes the the, the, um, the sympathetic guy, you know. You've got a hill giant here who's so, so low intelligence, um, you know, he can end up getting confused about what he's supposed to do even in battle. Uh, you've got a little dwarf here um, who basically is, you know, sad lot in life and finds himself down and out with these, these bandits. Um, and then you got, some, you got another dwarf who is like out of his mind crazy and um, just going to go into a blind rage. And so, you know, um, it, it's, it's an interesting idea. And I think he's definitely right that if you take the time to do this. Now, of course, your characters may throw a fireball and kill them all in one fell swoop. And then you put a lot of effort into creating these NPCs and backstories and where they care, but it's something to at least explain a little bit of human behavior between them certainly could make the encounters, um, you know, more interesting, right? Then we have a randomly inserted spell, um, the bone of contention. This is a clever spell. It's a level four illusion. You cast it either on a piece of ivory bone or a golden apple, and then you toss it in front of whomever you want and the illusion will cause everyone who sees it to be affected if they fail their saving throw and see whatever it is they most desire and so they will want it and they will also not want anyone else to get it including their own you know party members or other members of their band you know and they'll, they'll potentially right begin to fight and kill each other in order to gain possession of this item so it's a very clever use of illusion the critic is a one-page 
piece of, I'm going to call it creative writing. It's not even really a story. It's just like a little excerpt about this um, telling a story, which is, turns out is the imagination of a young boy who is um, reading a magazine. The Art and Science of Motorized Mayhem is just this guy explaining how to play um, Car Wars, the uh, Steve Jackson game. This guy's a big fan of it. We've got a page here with Hudson Shaw art, which, you know, that's awesome. So he's got a little Minotaur guy putting the Grecian formula on. I guess his fur was turning a little gray. And then he's got this random unicorn skull creature and just a little lizard man going around lighting some candles. And then finally this odd alien creature who's reading a magazine called the Earthman Chronicles, you know, play on the Martian Chronicles. So then Other Worlds, um, which is uh, the work by Mike Lewis. So he starts off with his review of the um, last issue, you know, the different people's articles and what he liked, what he didn't like about that, um, give some suggestions, and then uh, launches into his discussion of the Death Society, and uh, which is a description of, I think it's a Heroes game, let's see, Golden Heroes, and uh, just basically gives a description from their, their last um, play session and how the heroes, who they fought and how they survived. The Ilio is a new monster. Uh, it's not, it's well written, but it's not great because it's basically a six-legged badger. Um, and it really did make me think about, because it's not particularly aggressive, you know, so the, the, if you read the description, if you encounter this thing out in the wild, it's going to hide, so you may, maybe never see it. And it's going to try and basically just get away from the characters. Unless you go rooting around inside its lair, where it's got its, you know, made a nest or what, or a warren den for its babies. And then it'll fight to protect them like any, well, like a lot of animals would. Um, and it does have six legs, and so it gets extra attacks, and if it hits you with the first two legs, then the other legs can rend you. If it hits you, it hits a natural 20 on the second set of legs, I guess that, that'll knock your weapons out of your hand. It's just maybe it's a special attack, if you want to call it that. You know, but basically, it's a six-legged badger, which is okay. I guess it's something different. Certainly, you'll see, oh, it's a six. Oh, so this is the other thing. So when it runs, it can sort of lope with all three legs on one side and then the other, and it gives a weird movement that makes it a little harder um, to hit if it's running. So that's Mike Fig's contribution. Tales from Morak is a um, piece of fiction, you know, or story about... Um, these these heroes. I'm not sure if it's. I don't remember if it's coming from someone's actual campaign or it's just purely fiction. But these guys basically go into a um, into a tavern and get some drinks, and they drink it, and suddenly they start feeling kind of funky, and they get transported into an astral. I think basically astral plane, and they're going to have an adventure there. What I thought was interesting about it was that was the kernel, the idea. You know, you go into a tavern. Your character, your players are never telling you that in my experience I carefully watch to make sure where does he get the drink you know to make sure he doesn't roofie me or whatever um, so this idea that someone would be on the lookout for the party and have told the tavern especially if there's only one tavern in town I give these guys you know their drinks from this different barrel or whatever right um, and that then there's something that happens to them. Well, I don't know whether they're drugged or, some, or like this, then they have some sort of psychic experience. I really like this one, which is it's gonna, it's um, something about the drink transports you into an astral projection, and then you're gonna have an adventure there, which obviously means then you'll come back to the, um, back to the tavern, and then of course, assuming you survive, um, you're gonna have a very interesting conversation with the bartender, and you've got a little bit of a mystery to try and figure out who, who caused him to drug you and why, and that kind of thing, so. I thought it was an interesting story. Here's just the back page, and they tell you about how to send stuff. But the thing that caught my eye was this art. And I don't know because they don't say it, but I thought in the bottom left, that sure looks a lot like how um, Errol Otis sometimes would sign his art. And so I don't know if these crazy creatures, and if you look, they're sort of flipped upside down, right, copies of each other. Um, if I don't know if that's Errol drew this or somebody else, because um, anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting. And then here's Hudson Shaw's on the back cover. It says at last, and it looks like sort of a toadstool world. At least that's what it looks like to me. And uh, I really can't figure out what exactly is going on other than there's this giant, you know, toadstool tower here in, in the middle. 
That is it for Doom Book of Chaos number eight. Someday I may find number 10, and we'll obviously talk about that at the time, but I think this rounds out my discussion of Doom Book of Chaos. Um, I do have a number of other new fanzines to choose from, but next week we'll be going back to First Encounter, uh, the fanzine I've been looking at uh, up in Canada. You know, I looked through the first, I think, four, and now I've got four more to go. So that's it for this week. I hope you guys are having a great Friday. I hope you have a great weekend. Until next time, my friends, keep rolling 20s. (laughs) 